good morning. As we begin today, I want to recognize some friends that are here. Uh, we have some folks from the Association of International of Christian Schools International (ACSI). It's led by Dr. Larry Taylor. And we have guests that are here from the United States, from South Asia, from East Asia, from Latin America, from Europe, and Africa. Would all my friends from ACSI please stand at this time so we can welcome you. So glad you've come to be a part of this worship experience today. <clears throat> it's always great for us to be able to worship together as the body of Christ and people from around the world. I was thinking as I was uh, just reading those list of names, every Sunday we have people from all around the world who call this place home and they worship here, and we're excited to be able to do so. Hey, let's stand at this time. I want us to pray together, and I want us to uh, pray the Lord's Prayer together. So would you just stand right there where you are, and just a reminder, at our church, we're trespassers. We're not debtors. You know what I'm talking about. So let's, uh, let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Must be this tall to ride. You've seen that sign, correct? Take a look at the picture up on the screen here. There's a picture of uh, Baby Yoda, not tall enough to ride the ride. There are height requirements on certain rides when you go to uh, parks, you know, like Space Mountain or Big Thunder Mountain or the Matterhorn, or for you old Texas folks, the Judge Roy Scream. Probably the most dangerous roller coaster now. Uh, that, that thing's got a few, uh, few years on it, I'd say. But you know, there are just certain rides and there are certain mountains, you might say, that you have to, to be able to climb those, you have to be a certain height. And if you don't meet the requirement, you can be sad. You can be sad if you're not allowed to ride. Now, some people try to get around those rules that, that uh, those amusement parks have. <clears throat> and they put up, you know, they put on the shoes to kind of help them, all those those look like the shoes I run in, by the way, but uh, anything tall enough to ride the ride. But the fact is, sometimes you're just not tall enough to ride the ride. And it's not because the people at the park don't like you. It's a safety issue. That's why that rule is in place. Now, we tend to not like rules that tell us what we can or can't do. I mean, there's always somebody, we always hear about in the news, somebody that leans over the Grand Canyon just a little too far, and they make the news. There's always somebody that's at the zoo, at that glass that says, do not tap on the glass, and what are they doing? They're just knocking on that glass. We don't like being told, you can't do this, you can't go here, you can't do that. It's a reality of human life. But you know, it's also a reality of our spiritual lives as well. There are times in our spiritual lives that we don't like being told that we can't go somewhere unless we do something. Well, that's what I want us to think about today. So we continue our series, Divine Inquiry, and I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 24 today. Psalm 24. Now, today is not about rules to keep you off the mountain. It's about what allows you to ascend the mountain. Psalms so often, when you read the book of Psalms, it's so often like peering over somebody's shoulder, like they're writing in their journal, writing their personal thoughts, and we're kind of peeking in on what, they're, on what they're saying. But this Psalm, this Psalm is more instructive in nature. It was a Psalm that was meant to be read by the people, and it is a de declaration about our God. Now, David is the author. And he's calling on the reader to draw near to the Lord. This king of glory, he calls him in verses 8 and 10. The Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. And in this psalm, David teaches us a little bit about drawing close to him. Now, we live in the assumption that just anybody can approach God. We don't have to have a ticket. We don't have to stand in line. We don't have to be authorized. Now, while God does call his children to come to his side, there are guidelines that we should not overlook, 
There are requirements that are in place, and they're not designed to keep people out. Rather, they're designed to prepare our hearts for coming in. Think of it less as a prohibition and more as preparation. But it is essential preparation. It's not optional. We've been looking at these questions all throughout the summer, all these questions in the Old Testament in this series, Divine Inquiry. And that's where we want to start today is looking at the Divine Inquiry. David writes this psalm of praise and this this declaration of the Lord's victory. And in the middle of it, he calls people to worship. But not the running in, kind of scattered, kind of running behind, that, that thoughtless kind of way that we so often enter the place of worship. Instead, it's a calling on us to pause, to have time to stop and to to think. And he asks us to think deeply about a spiritual question. Look at verse 3, there of Psalm 24. It says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? That's a great verse, the great question that's asked there. Who may stand in his holy place? So we've got two questions that are asked back to back. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Holy place was a reference to the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord, is, of course, in the Old Testament is where the Lord would dwell. And we believe today that the spirit of God doesn't live inside this building, but he lives inside believers. I don't know about you, but I've been uh, grieved all weekend about what happened down at First Baptist Dallas. And the sadness that's in their hearts today, even as they gather to worship. They gather today with that building, that historic building, burned to the ground. But at the same time, that church knows, just like we know, that God doesn't live inside a building. But through his spirit, he lives in us. But in David's time, the presence of the Lord was assured at his temple. And David basically asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord? He's asking, how do, we, how do we come to that place? How do we get into that, that place where we're in the presence of the Lord? And for that to happen, you had to climb a hill. Now in Jerusalem, if you've traveled to Jerusalem, you know that the temple sits upon a hill. And in making your way into Jerusalem, you're even, you're even climbing hills as you're making your way in. You're ascending hills up to that place of worship. So, so David's question had a geographical meaning to it. But that's not really his focus. David is speaking more existentially here. He's speaking spiritually here. In a moment, we're going to get to all of that. But before we do, I want us to think a little bit about hills. Think about hills and mountains in the Bible. I want to talk to you about mountains in Scripture. Because in the Bible, mountains are more than mountains. Mountains are more than than just these gigantic piles of dirt, (laughs) But mountains are metaphors for spiritual growth. They they have a metaphorical meaning behind them. Mountains are, are high points physically, but they can also be high points spiritually in your life. But but getting to that mountaintop takes effort. When I was a kid, every year we would go on vacation, and usually vacation was either where the Southern Baptist Convention was, because my dad's in ministry, or it was to Ridgecrest or Glorietta. And some of you have been to uh, Ridgecrest or maybe been to Glorietta, Ridgecrest out uh, on the East Coast, and I love going to Ridgecrest, still love going there today. It's beautiful, up in the mountains. And uh, I remember one time when I was a kid, I remember this particular time that our family went during one of the breaks and we went to this mountain to climb this mountain. And I was so excited as a little kid and we started climbing it. And one of the things that I remember about it, it's kind of the, the first hill that I remember having to see not only me, but I had to see my parents kind of bending over and grabbing onto the ground to be able to get up the hill. It was pretty steep. And so I remember grabbing onto roots and rocks and whatever you could kind of hold on to to kind of make your way up this hill. Well, it took a lot of work, but we got up to the top. And when we got up to the top, what was there? It's a beautiful waterfall. This beautiful waterfall. And so here I am sweating as a kid from climbing up this mountain. And then my folks let me get into the water. And it was cold. But I remember it well. And I got to tell you why I remember it so well. I saw something in the water. 
And I reached down and I picked it up. It was a Timex watch. Takes a licking, keeps on ticking. I mean, that watch worked great. And so now I had this little watch just from, from climbing up. I mean, the beauty we saw and the treasure I found as a kid did not come on the easy road. It took the hard path to get there. Mountains in the Bible are often places of striving. Places of striving and work and effort. But what happens is that striving builds spiritual muscle in your life. Striving toward holiness challenges us. It's hard work. It's not easy to live a life that is pleasing to God, a life that is pursuing holiness. But, but what happens is as you strive, it develops within you this spiritual muscle, this spiritual growth in your life. So climbing and striving makes for growing. Amen. And all speak toward an intentional effort, determination, and, and even struggle. But man, it produces resilience and and muscle and depth. You think about Mount Sinai. You think about Mount Carmel. You think the Mount of Temptation. You think of the Mount of Olives. Mountains were places where, where struggles often took place. And mountains became metaphors for spiritual growth. Mountains are also places that God meets people. God meets people. Divine encounters happen on mountains. You think about Abraham. When he placed Isaac on that altar atop Mount Moriah. You think about Noah's Ark settling atop a mountain following the great flood. Think about Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. Think about Elijah meeting God on the mountain while he's in despair. It was on a mount that Jesus taught his most famous sermon. And atop that mountain where Abraham offered his son Isaac, God gave his son for each one of us when Mount Moriah became Mount Calvary. Mountains are places that that God meets people and places that God does great works. I've experienced some great moments with the Lord atop mountains, and some of you have, have as well. My friend Jarrett Stevens, he's pastor down at Champion Forest, he wrote a book about mountains. He said this, mountaintop moments, moments when we ascend into God's presence, give us a taste of his glory. And like a carrot dangling in front of a rabbit leaves us longing and aching for more. A fresh glimpse of who he is pushes us more into his presence so that we can grow in our relationship with him and help change the world around us. Mountains are great places to meet with God. And David calls on the people of God to ascend Mount Zion up to Jerusalem, up to the temple, to meet with the Lord, to be in his presence. But here's the thing. You must be this tall to ride. There are requirements. There are what I would call climbing essentials. To ascend the hill of the Lord, the psalm lays out certain requirements for us. Now, before we get into them, let me be clear about something. Everybody, every one of us who is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, every one of us can meet these requirements. So don't rule yourself out automatically and say, well, I could never do that. But you have to recognize it takes effort. It takes intentionality on your part. You got got to work at it. So look again in verse four. It says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. We see some essentials for mountain climbing there that I want to point out. The first is clean hands. He who has clean hands. In the Old Testament world, to enter the place of worship, a person had to be clean, whether they had gone, they were going to the temple or to their local synagogue. There were holy rites that were to be followed to enter into that place of worship. And that included the washing of the body and the washing of hands. And David is reminding us of our need for purity in our lives. It is a work of God's grace that offers that purity to us. It's not our attempts at goodness. It's not our attempts at saying, well, I'm just going to try to be a good person. It comes through the grace of God, and that grace of God combines with our desire and pursuit of holiness, and that creates those clean hands. And then closely linked to that are pure hearts, 
pure hearts. Again, if a person wants to draw near to the Lord, we've got to seek purity in our life. Now, there's not one of us in this room who is perfect, but every one of us can strive to do what is right. And when we approach the Lord, when we prepare ourselves to come to worship, we can confess our sin and we can ask the Lord to bring purity in our lives, to to wash our hands and to wash our hearts. Jesus said this, he said in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. I love what Charles Spurgeon said about that verse. He said, dirt in the heart throws dust in the eyes. I think that's great. If you want to draw close to the Lord, then you've got to seek that purity in your life. We can't just decide on our own that we have these familiar sins and God and I have worked everything out and he's okay with this. That's not how it works. We've got to admit and recognize the sin that is in our life and to have those clean hands, that clean heart, to have that moral integrity of the word of God in our life and it coming out in our words and in our thoughts and in our deeds. What a great reminder that is for us when we come to worship. We shouldn't rush into the worship service, but we should have our hearts prepared. I've heard it said for a long time that the preacher is not the only person who should be preparing for the sermon on Sunday. Every one of us as believers, as followers of Christ, should be ready to hear what God has to say to us. Well, here's the third one, and that is the rejection of idols. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol? Idolatry was rampant in the ancient world. It's easy for people to fall into that pit of idolatry, especially in those times. I mean, there were gods for everything in the ancient world and in today's world as well. still happening today. That that phrase talks about lifting up his soul. That phrase, lift up your soul, that means to put your trust in. It's an attitude of adoration. The Lord tells us in the Ten Commandments to have no other gods before him, but when we worship the things of this earth, We're putting other gods before him, be it idols of wood or stone or metal or bank accounts or a person or a position or material possessions. Sometimes we can even take spiritual things and make idols of them. No other gods before the one true God. If we want to ascend the hill of the Lord, That means that we've got to walk with the Lord and in walking with the Lord, he's got to be the number one priority in our lives. Well, fourth is truth or swear by what is false. Our God is the author of truth. He is truth and he demands truth in the lives of his followers. It means you and I, we're to be people of truth. God knows hearts and he doesn't buy into our lies. But it also refers to people who make a commitment to God. They say, God, I'm going to do this. And they fail to keep that commitment. That phrase has that same meaning as well. Some of your translations may say have sworn deceitfully. You see, when you lie, even if it's just a little white lie, when you lie, you speak the devil's language. It's his native tongue. And that's not going to draw you closer to the Lord. Rather, it's going to distance you from intimacy with him. Now, this list that's given here in verse 4 is not intended to be the full list. It's not the idea that, hey, you just got to do these four things, everything else will be fine. There's things the Lord may speak to you about in your heart. But David is making his point clear. If you want to draw closer to God, If you want to be nearer to God in your personal life, in your spiritual life, if one of your goals for your life is to say, hey, I want to walk with God and I want to be closer to God and deepen my relationship with God, you have to operate under the understanding that God demands purity of his children. We're not perfect. We can't offer perfection, but we can pursue purity in our life. He requires truth in our inner being. These are some of the climbing essentials that David identifies for us. Let's talk about the benefits of ascending. 
the benefits of ascending. What are, what are the benefits of committing yourself to ascending the hill of the Lord? Uh, let me just compare it to what I said earlier. What are the waterfalls and the Timex watches, so to speak, <laughs> that come from ascending the hill of the Lord? Look in verse five. He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God, his savior. So two are mentioned there in verse five. The first is blessings from the Lord. When you pursue the Lord, you pursue to walk in that relationship with him, to draw closer to him, to seek to have a pure heart, to have clean hands, to not give up, give yourself over to idols. When you seek to follow him and be a person of truth in all your ways, what happens is you receive these blessings. You'll be graced. You'll receive blessings from the Lord. So what are those blessings? Well, David doesn't say. Well, why? Because it's not really necessary to spell all of them out. God is good to his children. And when God pours out blessings on your life, let me tell you, it's always fantastic. It's always fantastic. You don't have to worry about what kind of blessings await you out there if you do these things. It's not about deciding whether or not you're going to pursue these things based on the blessings you're gonna receive. No, you are, you are being called to pursue these things and God has his best for you. But you have to make the decision to do that. He gives us a second, uh, second benefit and vindication from God, his savior. That literally means righteousness. That word vindication there. It's a picture of a judge's pronouncement in your favor. You are declared righteous by the Lord Amen. as part of being near him, of drawing near to him. And apart from his righteousness, apart from the righteousness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't draw near to the Lord. On our own, we're not good enough. None of us are righteous. But because of the work of Christ on the cross, you are declared right with God. Paul talks about this in in Romans chapter three, that, that our righteousness will never achieve what we want it to achieve on our own. But when we exchange our sin for the righteousness of Christ, we have something there that this world does not understand. And it's not something that we as believers can even manufacture on our own. Because of the work of Jesus on the cross as he atoned for our sin, we are made right with God. We are vindicated by our Savior, and that allows us to come into his presence. People who think they have a relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ, are actually being deceived by the devil. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through him. And in our world today, that is growing, that that statement is growing increasingly dangerous for people. Because it is a statement of the exclusivity of the Lord Jesus Christ And that bothers some people. But I would say it doesn't change the facts. When you know Christ and you are in Christ, then you can come into the presence of Almighty God. If you are apart from Christ, you're not able to do so. But when you know Christ, you receive his eternal blessings and you are declared righteous by the Lord. What benefits from ascending the hill of the Lord? So I want to talk about living on the mountain while you're in the valley. Today, we've seen how tall you have to be spiritually to ride the ride, so to speak. And it's, it's really not easy to do what David talks about there in verse four. I mean, the verse is a really simple passage, but it's very hard to do. But I think there's a characteristic that we all have to embrace that we all need in our life if we're really going to to, uh, try to live on the mountain while we're going about our business in the valley. And I can really just sum it up with one word. And here's the word, intentionality. Intentionality. You have to be intentional to ascend the hill of the Lord. Now, let let me make a distinction here. I'm not saying, we're not talking about, when we talk about ascending the hill of the Lord, we're not just talking about showing up at church on Sunday mornings. 
coming into the worship service, being here on Sundays. That takes some level of intentionality as well. I understand you gotta get up and you gotta get to church and you gotta make it without fighting with your family all the way to church. I know how church is, you know? But it's really more, what David is talking about is more than just showing up at church. What he's talking about is walking with the Lord. I contend that far too many Christians go to church, but they don't walk with the Lord. They don't walk with the Lord. To walk with the Lord, you have to be intentional about that. You have to be intentional about seeking holiness in your life, seeking purity in your life. When the Spirit of God speaks to you about not stepping into that pathway that's gonna lead you down a road to sin. You're intentional about saying, I'm not gonna do that because I wanna walk with the Lord. You're intentional about your heart. You're intentional about your attitude, about your words, about your thoughts, about what you put before your eyes. You're intentional so that you have purity of heart. And you're intentional about putting God first in your life. Not allowing people or possessions Things that you have become idols in your life. Idols that you worship through your time or through your money. Doesn't mean you can't love people. Doesn't mean you can't enjoy things in life. Can't have hobbies. Not saying that. But it means that you prioritize the Lord and his will and his ways as first in your life. It means that you seek truth and you speak truth and you walk in truth. But you have to be intentional to make it happen. So I've never just out of nowhere woke up and I was on top of a hill. It never happens. There is some effort that has to be made to get up to the top of that hill. You climb, you strive, you work your way. And in your spiritual life, you climb, you strive, you work your way to draw near the Lord. And that happens through the daily disciplines. The daily practices, those time, that time that is spent in the word of God through regular prayer. That prayer that is not just a list of demands that we give God of what we need him to work out in our life, but is truly a prayer of dialogue where we're listening for the Lord to speak into our hearts. It is that commitment to pursue the Lord in his holiness And to seek to understand what does it mean? What does it look like for me to live a holy life? It is choosing to make those right decisions when the wrong ones are before you. It is that ongoing self-examination, opening your heart before the Lord and saying to the Lord, Lord, search me. Search me, O God. You know, a message like this is one of those messages to be honest with you, that's just kind of simple. I mean, we didn't get into any complex, deep theological truths today. It's one of those messages that's kind of simple. In fact, it's so simple that most Christians don't bother to do it. It's so simple that they don't bother because they don't think about intentionally seeking him and seeking purity in their life. And then they wonder, why is my Christian life so average? And it's because they never ascend the hill. Amen. Sure, they may, they may walk up part of the way, but then they just find themselves heading back down to the reality of the world around them. And they miss the blessings that God has for them. If you're going to take the message that we've looked at today out of Psalm 24 and experience that in your life, then every day this week, you are going to have to be intentional about these matters. Otherwise, It'll be just another Sunday and just another sermon as you look up at the top of the hill briefly and go on with your life. Intentionality. That's what David is calling us to. 
So here's what I want us to do. I want to do something a little different today. I want to ask you to, um, in just a moment, I'm ask you to bow your head. And I'm going to let another psalm of David speak to our heart. And I want us just to have a time of prayer today. Just to pray before the Lord, you before the Lord, about your heart and about your life. And asking the Lord to help you in these matters. Because I think that sometimes we hear, but we don't seal. We don't put that sealant on our heart. And I want us to begin that process today. So would you just bow your head there where you are? And I want to read today out of Psalm 51. And I would like for the, to let us, as we've talked about purity and holiness in our life, to let this Psalm of David be yours today. Let this be your prayer today and just pray this psalm in your heart and your life as I read it, asking the Lord to do these things in and through your life. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. While our heads are bowed here today, if you've come into this place of worship and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I want you to know that that's the only way that you can draw near to God. It's not by your religion. It's not by your goodness. It's not by your good acts. It is only through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that you can come to the Lord. It is only through his death, burial, and resurrection that you can experience forgiveness and eternal life. If you've never experienced that in your life, if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you're not sure if you have, then I wanna invite you, after we finish singing in just a moment, to make your way to our connect room, the Glaston room there on the commons. And we have ministers there waiting to talk to you about what it means to receive Christ as your Savior to have your sin forgiven, to be made right before God and to become a child of God. I wanna invite you to experience that today. So in just a moment, 
after we sing, I want to invite you to make your way there. Maybe you have a different decision to make. Maybe you want to join our church or maybe like we talked about earlier, you want to be baptized. Maybe you've come today and you're feeling God's calling upon your life into ministry. Or maybe it's to be a missionary. God is speaking to you about that. Maybe you've come to this service today and you don't know what God is saying to you. You just know that there's something going on in your heart right now. That God is speaking to you. and You want to talk to somebody about that. Whatever your decision may be today, I also want to invite you to go to our connect room. And the ministers there will help you if you want to join our church or you want to schedule to be baptized or maybe you want to talk to somebody about what's going on in your heart and life. Maybe you just need prayer in your life. The good people there in that connect room will pray for you today. Our church is here to help people. We want to help you. And we want to help you make that connection with God. And so if you will open your heart and take a step of faith, and you'll be willing to go down to that connect room, I can guarantee you God will do great things in your life. I say this so often, but that connect room is the room of miracles. God is doing miracles in that room. And if you need a miracle in your life, then don't be afraid to go. But by faith, be willing to follow as the Lord leads you today. I wanna ask you to quietly stand where you are as I lead us in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you're a God who wants us to ascend the hill of the Lord. That you're a God who loves us so much that though our sins separated us from you, you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to give his life, to lay down his life on the cross and to die for the sin of mankind. And if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we can be saved. And that is because of your great love and mercy and compassion for us. So Father, I pray for those who are here today who need to receive you as Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, I pray for those who need to make other decisions, to to join our church or to surrender to ministry or to be baptized or just to talk to someone. Lord, I pray that you'd give them the courage and the faith to follow what you are leading them to do. So we thank you that you're a God who loves and guides. You're a God who is at work. And you're a God who moves in the heart of your people. Now, Lord, there are many of us in this room today who've been Christians for a long, long time. But God, help us to be intentional about pursuing holiness in our life. God, help us to be intentional. Intentional about seeking to have clean hands and a pure heart, to not be deceitful in our speech, to not turn our hearts over to idolatry and to worship the things of this world, to love the things of this world more than we love you. But Lord, may each of us as believers be more deeply committed today because of your word to draw near to you, to be intentional about holiness in our life. And may we be intentional about climbing the mountain, knowing that there are blessings that await. But God, may our desire not be for just blessings. May our desire to be, to be closer to you. So God, let it not just be a sermon at church, but Lord, may it be how we live our lives this very week as we seek to follow you. So Lord, there's not one of us today that do not have a way to respond to your, to your word. So Lord, draw us closer to you. Help people today that need to take those steps of faith. And may we follow you with pure hands and a clean heart. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Brent Taylor, pastor at First Baptist Church at the Fields, and we hope this worship experience for you is very meaningful and draws you closer to the Lord. Our church is praying for you, and wherever you may be watching us from today, we want you to know that you're always welcome in worship at our church. God bless you.